Well, today we're going to start a seven-week journey on transformation, that uh, God desires to transform us and to change us into His image, and, and, and we're going to look not only at how that happens, but we're going to look at, it, at how that happens in seven different areas in your life. And as we go through this series, here's what I know. For some of you, some weeks, you're going to be there and you're going to be amen because you're right, already there in that area. But I'll also say, out of these seven, there are going to be weeks where you're going to come in and God's going to speak to you and you're going to be under conviction because you know this is an area where you struggle in and God wants to bring transformation. Our verse that we're going to use to jump off every week is Romans 12 2. You see it there at the top of your notes. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, we're not to get our cues from the world around us, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Here's what we need to understand. The way you think determines how you act. And here's how I can prove that. It's been, you know, you, 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 uh, it's been a tough day already, and you know you need to go to the gym and work out. All right. Does your feelings, well, what, what determines whether you're going to go or not? It's what you think, right? That determines whether, okay, I know I don't feel like going, but I'm going to go because I know I need to go. Or are you going to go, you know what, I just don't feel like going. And, and I understand that's not about feelings. That's really about our mind determining what we're going to do. And, and so the way we think determines how we feel. The way we feel determines how we act. And, and so we need to understand this. If we want to be transformed, it comes through thinking differently. That we need to be transformed in the way that we think. And so we're going to let God's word speak to us in how we think about seven different areas, relational, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, financial, and vocational. We want renewed thinking so we have refreshed feelings, so we have restructured doing and a remarkable transformation. Over these next seven weeks, in these areas, we want to see God do a great work in our lives as we move from defeat and failure to faith and victory, from insecurity and inferiority to courage and boldness, from guilt and shame to peace and freedom. And today, we need to understand it all starts with spiritual transformation, and here's what we need to understand. The farther you get away from God, especially if you're a Christian, the more miserable you're going to be. The more you're going to struggle, the more difficulties you're going to have, the more trials you're going to see, uh, the more stress you're going to have. Why? Because you're not cooperating with your creator. You're not doing what he created you to do. But the opposite of that is true also. The closer we get to God. The more we're going to feel his love, the more we're going to uh, understand his grace and mercy, the more we're going to have purpose and peace of heart, and the more that transformation is going to happen in our lives. And so we're going to talk about how to draw close to God and what that looks like. But you know, the Old Testament warns us in Isaiah, it says this, all we like sheep have gone astray, each to his own way. In other words, the Bible, Isaiah, says that all of us as Christians and just to everybody as individuals, we, the Bible calls us sheep. Now, please understand that is not a compliment, all right? Sheep are probably the dumbest animals God ever created. I, I, don't, I mean, they just have no sense. Uh, if a sheep is walking, in fact, let's try this. Sheep are so dumb. All right. <laughs> That, that if they're walking along a uh, kind of a cliff and they see grass 40 feet down that looks greener than what's up here, guess what they'll do? They'll step off the cliff to go down and, and try to get the grass. I mean, they'll just kill themselves. They'll commit suicide trying to get the better grass. Sheep are so dumb. You know, I really should have worked this up. I just kind of came up with this. It would have been really good if I had worked this up. Routine. If, if they have full wool, Sheep will, will drink from a bubbling brook, and they'll get so much water in their wool that they'll actually suffocate. That's why scripture says, he leads me beside what? Still waters. Right? Because, so here's the deal. Since we're sheep, guess what? We need a shepherd. 
Because sheep have a tendency to wander. Sheep have a tendency to get in trouble. And, and, and sheep, if they're separated from, uh, from the herd, they, they're susceptible to all kind of dangers. And, and so the whole issue of spiritual transformation begins by being able to say, the Lord is my shepherd. And so as we begin, as we look at this story, the, the question that we would ask today is, do you know, first of all, that, that you're his sheep? And, and even if you are, understand this, sheep still wander. And so maybe you're his sheep, but you've wandered and you need to come back under the protection of the shepherd. Well, we're going to see that through a story that Jesus illustrated through a parable in Luke 15, starting in verse 11. Very familiar. In fact, we looked at it just several weeks ago. Jesus says this. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out uh, to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs, pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. One of the reasons this parable is so powerful is because at one time or another, on some degree or another, all of us have been the son. So we're going to learn about a wayward son and a loving father. So the son goes to the father and says, Dad, give me my inheritance. I'm tired of following your rules. I'm tired of doing things your way. I know better than you do. I'm going to go out and I'm going to run my own life. And and even though he didn't have to, his father gave him his inheritance. He headed off for Vegas, all right? He gets to Vegas. He spends all his money on wine, women, and wild living. He's partying. Next thing you know, he's broke. Well, now he doesn't have anything, and yet a severe famine, a depression hits the area, and he can't find work. And finally, he finds a farmer who's hiring out for somebody to come and slop the hogs. Now, I'm going to tell you what, I don't care who you are, that's not a good job, right? But to a Jew, that was detestable. That was an unclean animal. They, they weren't even supposed to touch them and, and be around them. And, and here he is feeding the pigs. I mean, let's be honest. Pigs were made to be eaten, right? I mean, I I just cannot imagine not being able to eat bacon. I mean, bacon has got to be the best. I think there's going to be bacon in heaven. I really do, without the side effects, all right? It's the best food. And then even the Canadians got bacon right, eh? I mean, you know, and so, I mean, bacon is, it's nothing better than bacon, but he was a Jew, so he wasn't even supposed to be around that. And he wakes up one day. In fact, I love what it says. He came to his senses. And here's what he he said. He goes, you know what? I'm here in this pigsty. And even the hired help at my dad's place have it better than I do. And so here's what he decided. I'm going to go home. I'm going to confess my sin to my dad. And I'm going to beg him to hire me out as a servant. And, And what we see is that when, when, as we read the story, he did that and we saw his father's response. And so today, if you've wandered from the father or if you've never known him as your shepherd or maybe you've been distant for a week or, or many years, 
we're going to look at four things that we do to be transformed spiritually and draw underneath the Father's protection. The first is this, to be spiritually transformed, I must, number one, get fed up with my life. You can feel it in the son's story. He was sick and tired of being sick and tired. He was sick and tired of being hungry. He was probably incredibly lonely and depressed. And he felt underappreciated and overworked. And he was so dissatisfied. He says something has got to change. And when you get to that moment, when you get desperate, when you get anxious for change, when you're fed up, when you've spent everything, when you have nothing, when you're hungry, when you're miserable, that's the moment you're ready for transformation. And and so so here's what we need to know in our lives. In, In our lives, spiritual transformation begins whenever we get fed up. And let me say this, you may look really good on the outside, and it may be a secret sin, and you're fed up of that sin, but nobody else even knows about it. Well, that's when you're ready for spiritual transformation. When you're saying, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, I no longer want to be the way that I am. And so I would say in in a group this large this morning, some of you here you are fed up with a sin in your life and you're, you're wondering why is it that you keep doing that and you're looking to change and you're ready for spiritual transformation. See, the transformation we're talking about, yes, is about becoming a Christian and transforming our lives totally to fall underneath the shepherd's leadership of our life, but it's also individually in all of our lives areas where God wants to transform even if we are believers, where we're fed up with the fact that we can't uh, seem to get in the word every day and pray. Where we're fed up with the fact that we cause more problems in our home and dissension in our home than unity in our home. We're fed up with the fact that we struggle with honoring God and our finances. We're fed up with the fact that we've never uh, introduced any friend to Jesus. We've never been a bold witness and, and we're fed up. And here's what you need to understand. That being fed up, that's a holy discontentment that God has put in your heart. Because you see, God wants to transform you in his image. And there are areas where he wants you to be fed up. And so you'll be miserable. In fact, the scripture says the only way we go to the Father is if he draws us. And one of the ways he draws us is that he makes us discontent in life. And we're ready for change. Some of you, you're in church today because sometime in the past, you hit that point where you were fed up. You found yourself slopping hogs. And you, you found yourself in a place that you know you got yourself into. And you turned to the great shepherd. And, and, and he came and he's leading you. And, and you've known that transformation in your life. And you're making sure you're in church every week. That you read the Bible. That you follow. Because you never want to go there again. Some of you here this morning, man, you're right in the middle of it right now. You're fed up and you don't know what to do. And we're going to look at those next steps. And let me also say this. Some of you are still partying and running on your own. And here's what I would say to you. You're still partying and understand one day you will face the pigs. But God loves you too much not to draw draw you to him. You're not in church by accident. You're here because God is drawing you. And and he wants you to do these next steps. In fact, in in your notes, you see Jeremiah 20, 13. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Do you feel the desperation and passion in that? You see, fed up people are desperate. and and, And God says, man, if that's where you are, come to me. Not only must I get fed up, number two, I must own up. I must own up to my sin. As you look at this parable, one of the great things you see about this son is when he came to his senses and he's going home, he's not blaming anybody but himself. Let's face it, in our culture today, here's what we've been taught. If we would have been the son going home, here's what we would have done. We'd have gone home and said, Dad, it's all your fault because you didn't hug me enough. Dad, the only reason I was in the pigsty is because you knew I couldn't handle it, yet you gave it to me anyway. I can't believe it. And we find a way to blame anybody and everybody else instead of owning up to our sin. 
The whole way home, man, the son is saying, Father, he's rehearsing his line. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. The only way spiritual transformation will happen in any of our lives is we must be willing to humble ourselves and own up to our sin. To say, God, man, I have blown it. I've been in charge. I've been doing my own thing. I've been running from you. That's the only way spiritual transformation will happen. In fact, I put this in there for a reason. Romans 3, 23, we all know it, but it's just a reminder. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So why do we pretend at times like we haven't? Like God is lucky to have us on his team and that we're, you know, kind of deal. No, we, we need that brokenness of heart. Because here's what you need to understand, man. If you feel distant from God, it is sin that is separating. You need to own up to that sin. Here's what you need to know this morning. The fact is you're as close to God as you choose to be. God is a father who's always waiting for us to come home. But if we don't admit and own up to our sin, we will never run to the father. Not only do I need to be fed up and own up, but thirdly, I need to offer up. I need to offer up. Offer up my life, my total being. Look at the transformation that happened in this son's life. He went from give me my share to make me a servant. I want you to see that again. He went from the beginning of this parable, give me my share, to now make me a servant. That's transformation. And that's what God wants from all of us. To come to him and say, Lord, I offer up my life as a living sacrifice to you. Use me as a part of your work. Transform me, make me the person you created me to to be. I offer up my body to you, my life to you. And look what happens when we do that. In your notes, look at a loving father's response. As we saw the father, here's what we saw. He, he never went looking for his son, but he was standing, looking out, waiting for his son to return. Why is that? Understand this. God will not force his love on you. He loves you more than you will ever know, but he will not force his love on you because forced love is not love at all. But he's waiting. And now imagine for a moment, put yourself in the son's place. And as you're walking home, you understand and imagine what you're feeling. You have blown a major part of your father's inheritance. You had dishonored your father in a, time, in a culture where honor was so important. You had committed about every sin under the sun. And as you're walking home, you keep rehearsing your speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Make me one of your servants. And you turn that corner and you see your father at a distance. And the father's reaction blows you away because the father starts to pick up his robe and to run toward you. You know what that son was thinking, don't you? He is going to kill me right here in the road. I'm dead. But then imagine what that son felt as he saw tears streaming down his father's face. And as his father came and embraced him and kissed him. And, and, it, and I'm sure the weight of the world, the son felt the weight of the world just fall off his shoulders at that moment. As his son, as his father so embraced them. Here's the thing. When we've wandered and we feel the, the sin, we feel the guilt of sin, and we've, and we've seen the destruction sin has caused. Many times we're afraid to go back to the Father and ask for forgiveness because we're afraid of the Father's response. Jesus told this parable so that we would understand what the Father's response is. He is waiting for us to come back. And the moment we do, man, he throws a party. And the truth we need to understand about this is the father said, bring out the best. Let's have a feast. Let's celebrate. Let me say this. God has a better plan for your life than you can ever imagine. And when we come back to the father, here's what we need to know. Transformation is never instant or overnight. It's a process. 
And that's why our walk with the Lord isn't based on emotions, but on a renewed mind. Because in a lifelong journey, man, we're going to have all kinds of emotions. There are going to be times when we stumble and fall and sin. There's going to be times you're going to feel like you're not saved. But it's not based on our feelings. It's based on a renewed mind that says, by faith, I trust God in these things. And that, and here's what Second Corinthians, Paul tells us, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the spirit that transformation is a lifelong journey there are going to be bumps in the road there are going to be times when it's tough but we we continue to trust him and ask him to lead us and shepherd us as that transformation is happening and the third thing, bullet on that we need to understand is this. Transformation is a process, but it does have a starting point. And so here's the question for all of us this morning. When was your starting point? Can you look at your life and say, you know, there was a time I was fed up. I owned up to my sin and I confessed that to God and I offered up my body to him and I became his sheep. I became his child. And yeah, I've wandered and I need to come back in the fold, but I know I'm a child of God. Can you come to, can you think about that time? But Chuck, I've been baptized three times. That's not what I'm asking, right? The question is, have you, were you fed up did you own up, and then did you offer up? I don't care how many times you were baptized. I don't care how many churches you joined. I don't care how good you try to act. I don't, uh, I, here's what you need to understand. The Greek word for transformation is metamorphosis, right? When I say that, what do you instantly think about? A caterpillar who becomes a butterfly. Look, there is no, there, there's no, uh, denial that there's been a transformation when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. Many of us, we're like chameleons. We change from brown to green and we think we're doing something great. God says, I come to make all things new. That you go from death to life, that, that you go from, uh, you know, from living for yourself to living for God. That transformation, there needs to be a moment in your life where you can say, that's the moment transformation began in my life. Again, it's a journey. It's not going to happen. It's not going to change everything overnight. But you can point to that time and say, in fact, here's what Paul said in Romans chapter 10 in your notes. He said, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with our mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. When was the point that you did that? Everything we're going to talk about from this point forward, the next seven weeks, is predicated on this one truth. If you're not spiritually transformed, the others won't happen. So when is that time? Here's what I'm asking us to do. Everybody bow your head and close your eyes. And maybe as I've been preaching, the Lord's really been speaking to you. Maybe even before you walked in here today, the Lord was speaking to you. And maybe you're fed up. And maybe it's a point where you're fed up of the fact of, uh, of being, trying to run your life and being in charge of your own self. And, and this morning, God's saying to you, let that go and turn to me. Maybe you're a sheep that's wandered and you need to come back. Or uh, maybe this morning, what you need to do is own up to your sin. You need to humble yourself. And say, God, as best as I know how, I turn from that sin and I turn from you. And then you offer up your body. You want to know what salvation is? It's those three steps. It's not any more complicated than those three steps. I got to be fed up. I want to change. I want to be transformed. I got to own up to my sin and the mess that I've made in my life. And I've got to offer up my body to Christ. I want to pray for all of us right now. Lord, I pray that this morning in this room that there are those here 
who need to do those three steps for the very first time. That God, they, they need to know your love as a shepherd, your uh, forgiveness and your mercy and your grace in their lives and the direction that you give and, and the peace that you bring. And, and God, I pray this morning, if there are those here that, that are in that, that they would, God, have the faith to trust you. They would believe your word and that they would, God, own up to their sin and they would offer up their bodies to you that they would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that you raised him from the dead. Look, every head's bowed, every eye's closed, the lights are even low, but if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, if you just said, God, I'm fed up, I offer up, I own up, and I offer up. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, would you just slip your hand up real quick so I could see it and pray for you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, for those who now lifted their hands, I, I pray that you would begin that good work in their lives. And God, that they would, uh, Father, start that journey of knowing you as their shepherd. And that, God, you would bring true transformation to their lives. God, for others who are here who have wandered from the flock, that you would draw them back. God, begin that process of spiritual transformation in our lives as we walk through these next weeks. That seven weeks from now, we look at ourselves and say, I am not the person I used to be because of the power of God transforming me. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. And here's something unusual. The sermon's not over. There's a fourth point. And the fourth point is this, offer up. Offer up praise to God. That, Julian, do it, man. All right, offer up praise to God. You see, once we have become fed up, we don't own up to our sin. We offer up our bodies. And, and God, in his mercy and grace, wraps his loving arms around us. Then our response is to offer up praise to him. And here's the cycle I want you to see. When God redeems me, when he saves me, when out of his love he reaches down and starts that transforming power, that transformation in my life, then what happens is I understand his love for me. His love for me drives me to want to live for him more and to serve him more. As I serve him more, I want to praise him more for his grace and mercy. As I praise him more, it's going to cause me to love him more, which is going to cause me to serve him more, which is going to cause, it's a whole cycle there. And we get in trouble if we break that cycle. So in just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to worship. But it's not a Sunday morning alone thing. It's something we should do every day of the week as we thank God for his mercy and grace. And it's, look, praise is not all just about singing. It's through, it's through the way we live. It's through our prayers. It's, it's through the way we serve others that we praise God. So let's stand as we praise God for all he's done for us.